Buongiorno. Sabah al-khair. Good morning. Good morning. How well do you know the Earth, our home planet? On this little pale dot, said the astronomer Carl Sagan, all histories are written, all battles are fought, all lovers kiss, and all families love. It is our home, our cradle, and protector. How well do you know the planet that it gave rise to our species and our way of life? Most of us live out our lives in a relatively limited geographical space on our vast planet. Though we belong to the only species that has managed to make the entire planet its home, our outlook as individuals on who we are and where we belong is predominantly provincial and local. For the vast majority of us, we experience a sense of belonging and loyalty to one or perhaps two geographical regions, nations, ethnic or religious groups or denominations. The largest entity to which any of us typically have some sort of solidarity and sense of attachment is to a particular great tradition or civilization, though some of us may aspire to or even express sentiments of global citizenship and planetary consciousness, such sentiments all too often are dismissed as impractical and naive and may even be perceived by some fellow citizens as disloyal, unpatriotic, and dangerous. The theme of this conference is a culture in crisis, flows of people, artifacts, and ideas. The disconnect between our provincial outlook on the world as individuals and members of local towns, provinces, and states, and the dire condition of our planet on the verge of climate catastrophe is a crisis of a scale that our human species has never had to face before. Today, I want to talk about this crisis. I will touch on the ways in which our work as scholars has helped create and sustain it and make a few suggestions on how we can contribute to resolving it. As a remedy, for this crisis, I wish to present the case of a, for a global turn. By this, I mean a shift in one's outlook toward greater awareness of how our attitudes and actions as individuals and scholars impact the condition of our planet and the prospects for an inhabitable Earth home for future generations and other living creatures. I believe such a turn is urgent for the survival of our species and key to keeping our various disciplines relevant in a globalized world with global scale challenges. As scholars rooted in our own ethnocentric cultural worlds, we have played a significant role in producing and reinforcing the provincial outlook of the wider society of which we are a part. The disciplines and areas of specializations that we have invented to organize research, teaching, and public outreach dealing with the Near East have all too often involved an ethno-Eurocentric bias. For those of us coming from the West, we have emphasized storylines about our own desired past, especially that of the biblical and Greek or Roman worlds. And as Edward Said has alerted us, as academics, we have been complicit in creating and reinforcing a narrative about the present day peoples of, and cultures of the Middle East as the opposite of ourselves, as the other. In this way, we have hardened and helped to harden and sustain the parochial sentiments that have produced the current crisis of outlook and understanding of those other than us of other living things and of our planet as a whole that now we find ourselves entrapped in. 
As scholars of the Eastern Mediterranean lands and of the history of Jordan in particular, we have an ethical and scientific mandate to find a new narrative about this region that overcomes the Eurocentric and Orientalist leanings of much past scholarship. This is what the call for a global turn is all about, challenging us to imagine and share a new kind of history that widens rather than narrows our own and our fellow human beings' outlook on others and on other living creatures and on our planet. Such a turn is urgent because the crisis of survival we face requires a broader outlook. Continuing onward with the status quo is simply bad scholarship, bad science, and bad for, uh, for uh, the planet. But how can we change the status quo and make our research resonant with the challenges of our global age? I would like to propose six steps that can start us on this journey. A first step is to give critical thought to the interpretive lenses that we use to research and narrate the past. Interpretive lenses help give us a general sense of reference and guidance as we approach our research. As we have already noted, the lenses we use as scholars can contribute to either narrowing or widening of our outlook and understanding of other people and of the planet. Our esteemed colleagues researching Jordan's prehistoric past deserve a shout out here. From the very start, their research has been exemplary in using lenses and propagating narratives that have emphasized our common heritage as homo sapiens. They have also paid detailed attention to the interaction of humans with other species and with the local environment. We have them to thank for bringing the archaeology and prehistory of Jordan to the attention of scholars and the public all over the world. Those of us who focus, uh, whose focus has been on the historical past of our region have favored questions and interpretive lenses that have largely ignored our relationship to, our spe to other species and the environment. Our research has been animated by subtle and not so subtle longings for a particular desired and admired historical past. And this is not only a criticism of our biblical scholars, but also of those working in the fields of classical and Islamic history and archaeology. Much of this research has been laden with an urban, elitist bias. Our approach has tended to be from the perspective of ancient texts, from the point of view of empire, from the heights of ancient citadels and towns. To a large extent, we have not concerned ourselves with the lives of the masses living in the shadows of such heights and in their hinterlands, the lives of families of shepherds, farmers, craftsmen, and miners. And as for the impact on the local environment and on other living things, our ponderous tomes are largely silent. A second step is to stay informed about new interpretive lenses and approaches being developed by global historians that can help us rethink the way we frame our research questions. Global history seeks to understand the past through the lens of connectivity from an interspecies perspective and on a planet-wide canvas. Neither traditional periodization schemes nor traditional units of spatial analysis can be taken for granted. Global history instead seeks to create a new narrative of humanity's past that is neither confessional, nationalist, imperialist, nor Western, but truly global in geographical scope and narrative. It is a project inspired by images of our planet streamed from satellites orbiting the Earth. It is made urgent by the accelerated pace at which human activity impacts and overwhelms our environment and our planet's regulatory processes. As many of you know, my research over the past five decades has focused on the Madaba Plains region in Jordan particularly at the archaeological site of Tal Hispan and its surrounding region. 
In my efforts to use global, the global history lens, I have tried to imagine myself positioned in a fixed location in space, observing the Madaba Plains project over multiple millennia. From this vantage point, I have imagined examining the various forces that have impacted local cultural production and change over time. In line with the approach of global history, my aim has been to discover long-term processes on a planet-wide canvas that transcend conventional historical periods and civilizational boundaries. A dozen intertwined stories, storylines spanning multiple, multiple millennia have come into view in our project area from this overlook high in the sky. These include stories of changing patterns of livelihood and food production, the impact of innovations in technology and warfare, the rise and fall of local elites and imperial powers, the birth and spread of great religious movements, the migration of diverse groups of people in and out of the region, deepening entanglements of the local with the global, the devastations wrought by epidemics, famines, and other extreme events, the resilient coping strategies of the local population, the unprecedented growth in human population and technology uh, that we have seen over the past century and a half, the impact of all of the foregoing on the survival of other species and the local landscape, and stories of desired pasts, contested pasts, forbidden pasts and propaganda pasts. And last but not least, hypothesis about the underlying long-term drivers of change in this region. A third step we as scholars can take is to, situ is to situate whatever problem we are trying to study within a long-term frame of reference. This too is a signature feature of global history and we have Braudel and the Annal School to thank for breaking up the cartel which has situated, which has sustained the fiction of the past as consisting of clearly delimited historical periods. The original expedition to Talhespan under Professor Siegfried Horn of Anders University Theological Seminary had one primary objective, finding biblical Heshbon. The team, now under the leadership of Horn's successor, Professor Lawrence Garrity, also of Andrews, would not have lasted long had they not soon accommodated themselves to the inconvenient truth that the hill they had come to dig was by no means exclusively a biblical period a ruin. What they ended up uncovering was an abundant array of well-preserved architectural features and a rich assemblage of pottery and other artifacts most of which came from more recent classical and Islamic context. Even as Braudel's tomes challenging long-standing historical conventions were still being translated into English, the Heshbon expedition leaders were channeling his revolutionary vision of embracing a long durée orientation as the way forward for their research at the site. This has continued to this day to be a core feature of the work of the Tal Hespan project, but also of the rest of the Madaba Plains Consortium. A scan of the abstracts posted online for these meetings reveal deep time perspectives are no longer only the purview of prehistorians. It has also become an explicit approach of a number of projects concerned with later periods, and that not only regional surveys, but also excavation projects. The sorts of interpretive lenses used by these projects include studies of placemaking, water management technologies, territorial management, desertification, and environmental degradation. A fourth step in the, is to embrace the notion of connectivity as an influencer of local cultural production and change that functions apart from imperial agendas or civilizational confines. A line of research that has accelerated with the global turn in the academe are projects tracing the origins of roots of the worldwide spread of particular commercial products, such as aromatic resin, resins, sugar, salt, wine, and much more. In these meetings, there are at least half a dozen presenters on winemaking in Jordan, 
Surprisingly, though, I did not notice any studies of trade or aromatic res resins, surely a most important window on connections impacting the history of Jordan. The study of social networks is another burgeoning approach among global history researchers. And I see we have several papers that do so here. Examples from these meetings include inquiries into the role of networks in the early and middle Epipaleolithic, late Neolithic ceramic and obsidian networks, homemaker networks during the EB3, and Mamluk trade networks for the movement of sugar. A fifth step is to prioritize whenever and wherever possible investigations of interconnections between humans and animals, humans and the environment. Stories of ecosystem engineering projects at all levels of society are important to a global turn because what they can tell us about the accumulative impact on other living species and on the natural environment of such activities. Such studies are also pivotal to understanding the root causes that have brought us to the dawn of a new geological epoch, the Anthropocene, the era when the activities of humankind are overwhelming and rapidly altering the Earth's natural processes, climate, sea levels, soil regeneration, fish and wildlife survival, extinctions, and much more. Not surprisingly, the prehistorians in our conference are addressing many of these concerns the rest of us, for the most part, are not. The attention to water-related topics and desertification nevertheless holds promise. Of the dozen or so papers dealing with water issues in our program, nearly half are focused on the Southern, Jordan, and Petra region. Approaches to this topic include studies of flood control methods, terracing practices, water pipelines, garden pools, underground cisterns, open air reservoirs, rainwater harvesting, urban water management, and Roman baths. But none of these papers, as far as I can tell, make an explicit effort to relate their research to the Great Acceleration and the Anthropocene crises. A sixth step is to engage host communities where we carry out our projects with our fieldwork and research agendas. The global history storyline with its concern for our planet and its well-being is pivotal and well worth sharing with local residents where we work. They, as much as ourselves, have a stake in preserving our planet as an inhabitable place for future generations. Engaging our host communities with the global history storyline opens to a broader outlook on the past and on what we do as archaeologists. It makes possible seeing the past in a way that is different from the ethnocentric gaze that is the received point of view of most of us where the past is concerned. It can even inspire grassroots activism on behalf of the environment and is clearly a sustainable way forward for protecting Jordan's archaeological heritage. Jordan is in the vanguard in the Islamic world and beyond when it comes to community engagement and public outreach. Proof of this are the many sessions and papers devoted to this theme in these meetings. The USAID sponsored sustainable cultural heritage through an engagement of the local communities project, project the virtual Petra initiative, the Al Halabat Interpretation Center, the Jordanian Museum's National Awareness Outreach Program, the UNESCO-sponsored Seco Petra Project, the Madaba Regional Archaeological Museums Project, the Amman Citadel Community Engagement Initiative, the Archaeology Clubs of Jordan Schools Initiative of the Friends of Archaeology, the Employment Through Community Heritage Project, and the King's Highway Community Engagement Initiative. But a question for the leaders of each of these initiatives is, to what extent do these uh, do the storylines that propagate narrow or widen outlook with regard to the environment and the global scale crisis we now face as humans. Leonardo da Vinci, the Florentine genius whose 500th anniversary 
is being marked these days around the world, is reported to have said, learn how to see, realize that everything connects to everything else. In his biography of Leonardo, Walter Isaacson stresses how much Leonardo always pulled from different fields and disciplines to guide his art. He studied optics, geom geometry, math, and anatomy to both satiate his curiosity and better inform his art. The more he understood as a, a reality as it was, the better he could reflect it and combine it with his imagination in his creations. The global turn is a call for a renaissance of outlook and vision for dealing with the crisis of culture that has brought us to the verge of climate catastrophe. It is a demand to those of us with narrowly specialized fields of expertise to give thought to and to articulate how what we do fits within a larger whole. It is an appeal for all of us to rethink and perhaps even reinvent our programs of research to more clearly reveal to our students and to the public the relevance of what we do to address the greatest crisis facing humanity today. I would like to thank the organizers of this conference for challenging us with the theme, Culture in Crisis, Flows of People's Artifacts and Ideas. It is evident from the sessions and papers that will be delivered this week that they have succeeded in fostering many new and promising approaches to the history and archaeology of Jordan. And as I have shown, many of these are, uh, show that we are already anticipating the global turn in what has been presented. During this week, I challenge all of us to undertake a critical vetting of this call for a global turn for our field. To what extent are we as scholars complicit in creating and sustaining the cultural and environmental crisis we face today? What, if any, are the pitfalls of a global turn for our field? What collective actions might we take that would capitalize on the momentum already underway? In the words of the Apostle Paul, the whole creation groans. The question now is, what can we as individuals, scholars, and teachers do about it? I close with another saying of Leonardo. I have been impressed with the urgency of doing. Knowing is not enough. We must apply. Being willing is not enough. We must do. Thank you for letting me share in this way my hopes and personal passion for a global turn for the history and archaeology of Jordan.